time, um, I put this quote out there, and maybe you read it, maybe you didn't, but sometimes the best um, theological answer is, I don't know. And you need to know it's okay to say, I don't know. When the scriptures speak to something, we should speak to it. When the scriptures are silent on something, all it is is speculation. You're getting my opinion or you're getting somebody else's opinion if the word of God has not spoken towards that particular subject or that particular uh, question. So let's just remember that as we have a good time studying the word of God together and we dig into our Bibles privately and corporately. We're going to now have a time of corporate prayer. Um, and so I want to begin our time because I know, um, I know since it's been out on the church um, prayer request um, service. I know we're all concerned and been praying for Raymond, and, and I believe Randy's going to going to address that. So I'm going to let him go ahead and start with that. Yeah, I got a phone call. For, I called Margie today about six o'clock. She just got in from the hospital. You know, you had a CT scan yesterday, and, and it didn't look real well. So they did a heart cath today, and everything looked fine. Uh, they're thinking now that it's just muscle spasms around his heart, that he doesn't have a problem with any veins or any, any parts of his heart, and that if he continues to do well, he'll be coming home tomorrow. So praise God for that. Amen. Also, Amen. Pastor, I just got sure. a text from Terry Bergshaw. Mm -hmm. He is not feeling well, running a fever and aching, so he asked me to ask the church to pray for him. Okay. Remember Terry in our prayers tonight. Anybody else? Prayer request? Praise? Okay, D? Microphone will come to you. I would like for you to remember my brother, Jimmy Thompson. He lives in Hunter. Oh, heck. He lives in North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> he has prostate cancer, and he goes to the oncologist on the 11th of this month. And his wife, Sadie, is in rehab where she had a, a hip replacement reconstruction because she broke her hip. And she's not going to be able to put weight on that leg for four to six months. So please remember them. Mm, okay. Anybody else? Prayer request? Praise? Okay, over here. Yep. Right. Mm. Uh, pray for our daughter-in-law, Tansy Mulligan. Uh, she will be having major back surgery at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida on next Wednesday and Thursday. They're putting well, like two rods in her back and a bunch of other stuff. It's going to be major. And uh, we just hope that it's going to help her with some quality of life. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's been much prayer for that. Anybody else? Here we go. Okay, yes. My uncle Don Fowler has cancer in his um, on his tonsils, and he's starting radiation. Keep her uncle in our prayers, Randy. Right, if you there. <laughs> um, just Friday, if I could have prayers, I'd go in for my MRI um, on my brain tumor, and let's hope that it's gone down <laughs> amen 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 i think pat's pat you wants remember to remember me next uh, tuesday i go in for my knee replacement all right pat's got a knee replacement let's keep that in our prayers um i think carolyn there try to make it fast um chris Merck, a guy that had done some renovations for me is still in the hospital he had COVID and he's uh, supposedly over supposedly over that, but he still has double pneumonia. And I have a cousin, daughter in Florida, I haven't heard from her. She had feeding tube put in, there's spleen uh, removed and all kind of stuff. So her name is Lynn Scott. Mm. And I'll continue to remember my children, grandchildren. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? How about unspokens tonight all over the house? I wanted, um, did you have something or just unspoken? Okay. Um, I want to do something a little bit different tonight, okay? Um, I want us to spend just a few moments in some 
intentional prayer. We have mentioned physical prayer requests. And so, of course, we want to lift those up to the Lord and be in prayer for those that have been mentioned. But also want us to remember our spiritual prayer requests as well. Uh, Let's remember our church, that the Lord has called us to serve and to be a part of. Let's remember uh, the local church in our prayers and our, our personal discipleship that, uh, that we don't want to just fill our heads full of the knowledge of the Word of God, but we want to make sure we are following Jesus and we are taking steps in our own life to be salt and light. And that has to do with us sharing the gospel on a regular basis, has to do with us um, just being the hands and feet and showing Jesus as well as telling about Jesus to a lost world. So for just a few moments, if you want to pray where you are, if you want to gather around the altar, we're going to have a moment of prayer, um, and then we're going to go into our Bible study, okay? So just do as you feel led to do, but we're going to do this for just, just a few moments. close this time out in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we have mentioned physical things tonight, people that are sick, people that have health problems, um, all kinds of 
issues, Lord. And Lord, as we have privately prayed and sought Your face for those spiritual things in our lives as well. And Lord, there's so many things, even spiritually, that we could pray for that would kind of dominate our minds and hearts. But Lord, Your Spirit keeps taking me back to Jeremiah 9. And I keep thinking about Your presence. Not power, not strength, not intellect, but Your presence. And Lord, I pray that as a church, we would seek Your presence. We would seek Your glory. And that everything that we accomplish as a church, it would be done for Your glory. And Lord, I pray tonight as we dig into the subject of the rapture tonight, as we look at Your Word, I pray that You would be glorified and the church would be edified. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. So tonight I want to go ahead and encourage you to take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The passage is verse 13. And we're going to look down to verse, um, verse 18. And that is kind of the zenith passage in Scripture for the doctrine of the rapture. I want to frame our time together tonight by telling you about an amazing character in, um, in history. He was an illusionist. Who has ever heard of Harry Houdini? Anybody? <laughs> amazing character to read about and to study. There's even movies, even modern movies that have been done on Harry Houdini. Houdini could escape from any situation you put him in. They put him in these sacks and he would escape from them. They would put him in a box and they would chain the box and they would put it at the bottom of a lake. And don't you know that he found a way to get out of that box. They put him in jails and he could escape from those jail cells. It didn't matter what the situation was, Harry Houdini had a way to escape the situation. But then something happened. There came a time and there came an event that Harry Houdini, as talented as he was, could not escape. That event was his own death. As he was laying there, and as he was about to die, he told his wife, whom he loved. He said, if there's a way to escape death, if there's a way to get out of the grave, if there's a way to come back, I'm going to find it. I will find you. I will come back to this house. For 10 years, on the anniversary of his death, his wife lit a candle and put it on the mantle in the hopes that Houdini would find a way out of that grave and he would come back, escaped death and the grave to see his wife again. Ten years came, ten years passed. No Harry Houdini. I'm here to tell you, there was another man in history. His name was Jesus. And they put him in a grave and he was no illusionist. And he got up out of that grave and he rose from the dead. In 1 Corinthians now, chapter 15, preachers have made the mistake over the years of preaching that passage at, on Easter Sunday, talking about the resurrected Christ. But that passage is really not about the resurrected Christ. That passage is really about the bodily resurrection that we're all going to encounter. 
Jesus rose from the dead, those in Jesus, their physical bodies will also be resurrected. We're no illusionist either, but guess what? We don't have to be because God is going to raise those bodies for his purposes in his time. I want to begin tonight by looking at this wonderful passage, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13 through verse 18, and the church is facing a lot of turmoil in having to do with the bodily resurrection. And there was a mystic idea that was going around that the body is evil, matter is evil. And so God would never resurrect a body. God would not have a bodily resurrection because he wouldn't take something evil and full of sin and raise that And so the people were really fearing and really facing that their loved ones that had already died, that they would never see them again. And there was a lot of misunderstanding as it came to a bodily resurrection. And so Paul addresses the church here, and I love it when Paul addresses a subject like the rapture, like spiritual gifts, like those kind of heavy things. He uses a terminology I want you to be informed, or I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren. I want you to know what the Scripture teaches. Jesus said to the Pharisees, your problem is you don't know the Scriptures. In this culture today, we would have to say, by and large, as far as the culture goes, don't know the Scriptures. We need to know the Scriptures. We need to get back to the scriptures and evidence of that is I saw a statistic this week that said 55 percent of a certain group of people doubt the deity of Christ we're not in the book we don't know the scriptures and so tonight as we think about a subject like the rapture let's think about it in the context of what God has to say in the scriptures. Let's look at it. Verse 13 through verse 18. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, concerning those who are asleep. That's a nice way of saying dead. So that you will not grieve like the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, In the same way, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Here it is again. Verse 15. For we say this to you by a word from the Lord. So understand that. This is not Paul's thoughts. This is not Paul's intellect. By the Lord. God is saying this through the Apostle Paul. Who uh, We who are still alive at the Lord's coming will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are still alive who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. It has been my observation that people are very... um, I don't think obsessed is the right word. I just, I just think excited about uh, the end times, about the book of Revelation, about um, last things. They want to know how it's going to happen. They want to look for signs. They want to try to dive into 
um, a world they don't know much about, and they want to collect all these facts, and they want to try to figure out these events. And what happens oftentimes, I find, is people oftentimes will take all of the events and they will just mix them all together. Today, um, I see people debating this constantly. I see people saying things like, Jesus could come any moment now. Jesus could come any minute. And oftentimes what I see happening is people mixing up at least four different things, okay? Four different things are being pushed in to one category. So you have the rapture of the church. You have the tribulation. You have the uh, return of Christ. You have the millennial reign of Christ. All four of those things are singular things. All four of those things are different events. They're not all one event. And so we have to kind of break them apart and we have to look at them in the unique context that they're in. And so oftentimes you hear somebody say, well, Jesus could come back at any moment. What they're really referring to most probably is the rapture of the church. Because scripture teaches, I believe, that that's going to happen first. You're going to have the rapture of the church. And so as we start to kind of break this down, I wanna address a few things that, that has become problems, perhaps. Now, first, at its, at its basic understanding, the rapture of the church is that singular event that does not have judgment attached to it. It's where God gives the word to Jesus. Jesus calls for the rapture of the church. And in that very quick moment, we are caught up. We are sucked out. We are in this instantaneous moment, here one minute, with Jesus in the sky in the next moment. It happens that quickly. And when we look at this, at this rapture, when we look at the rapture of the, of the church, what we are essentially dealing with, ladies and gentlemen, is that it's not a return because Jesus does not come down. We come up. It is not that Jesus returns, it is that we meet Jesus in the sky. So the first critique, the first question, the first criticism that often comes to the rapture is simply this. Maybe you've heard it, maybe you've thought about it. If the rapture of the church is biblical, why is it that when we study scripture, we do not find the word rapture in the Bible. Let me just ask you tonight, have you ever read the Bible? Have you ever read through the New Testament? And have you ever found the word rapture in your Bible? And if you have, where's it at? Where's the word rapture at in the Bible? Anybody want to take a Stab tonight, take a guess tonight. Have you, have you ever studied and found the word rapture in your Bible? What's that? <laughs> no, that's not fair, Levant. You're cheating. <laughs> I mean, have you ever seen it? And let me ask you this. If the word rapture isn't there, does that necessarily mean the idea of rapture isn't biblical. It isn't true. Now let's just suppose tonight that we're all right and that rapture isn't in the Bible, okay? Do you want to know another term that isn't in the Bible? 
that you won't find the actual term in the Bible? Anybody know? What's that? Taken up. Um, caught up, okay. But I mean, is there another, is there another um, doctrine where that word maybe isn't in the Bible? Does anybody know what that is? How about Trinity? You know, you won't find the word Trinity. You'll find the idea. You don't find rapture, we, we might say. But you find the idea, right? But let me just take it a step further tonight. What if I were to tell you that rapture actually is in the Bible? <laughs> what if I was to tell you that this term actually is right in the text we just read, in fact, in verse 17, then we who are still alive, who are left, will be, there it is, caught up. You say, wait a minute, what are you doing here? Well, if you look at where caught up originated from, it's from a Latin phrase. And the Latin phrase is repturo. Rapture. Caught up comes from the word rapture. So here it is right here in verse 17. And I owe Mr. Mann, my high school Latin teacher, an apology because I said to him, Mr. Mann, I will never need this. I will never use this. Why do I have to take this class? You're wasting your time. None of us will ever use the insignificant language of Latin. I'm sorry, Mr. Man. It came in handy. That word was important. And you see, we may think, oh, well, you know, why is that so important? It's important because what if you're out sharing the gospel with somebody and they start bringing up things like, oh, Y'all believe in that rapture stuff. It's not even in the Bible. And you can say, actually, in verse 17, caught up is the Latin transliteration of rapture. So it is right here in the Bible. That could be a whole turning point of somebody taking the words that you are saying for sharing the gospel seriously. It pays to know what the Bible says. And so... We have that debunked. Not only do we have that word from the Latin phrase, but we also have the idea here, caught up, raptured, taken from the earth instantaneously. In the moment, it happens that way. Let's, let's go a little further as we, as we, look, in, as we look into the, this. Have you ever thought, who is it exactly that will be raptured. Who's going to be raptured? It's going to be the church, right? But what does that even mean? What does the church mean? Does that mean Eastside Baptist Church? Does that mean First Liberty? Does that mean First Baptist Dallas? Does that mean who, whatever church you want to name? Here's the thing. Some in Eastside, perhaps, aren't going to be raptured. Some in First Liberty probably aren't going to be raptured. Some in First Baptist Dallas aren't going to be raptured. Here's the thing. Church means the universal church. Church means anybody who has trusted Christ as their Lord and Savior. Has nothing to do with our church roles. Has nothing to do with who might have gone through the waters of baptism. Or I would say got dunked at that point has nothing to do with somebody that just makes some claim. It is real, legitimate Christians that once they're saved, they become part of the church. And when the rapture occurs, it is that moment where real, genuine Christians are taken from earth to heaven to be with Jesus. Any questions as we... Continue to go a little deeper and a little further. Any questions you have? 
Mm, that's a great that's a great question. Now remember the context is that those at the church of Thessalonica are concerned about their loved ones. So the dead in Christ, their bodies rise first. The ones that are alive on the earth during this time, they follow those who have already died. And so the dead go first, and then the alive are caught up after the bodily resurrection. Yes, good question. Any other questions? I'm just glad nobody asked, explain to me about my glorified body. (laughs) Because that's a whole other sermon. That's a deep, deep subject. (laughs) Okay, let's move on. Let's ask it in a different way. Um when is the rapture going to occur? I mean, that's really what we want to know, isn't it? I mean, our minds just want to have that answer. I mean, somebody says, I want to meet with you. When? When do you want to meet, right? (laughs) I got something we need to talk about. Okay, can we meet now? (laughs) Let's get this over with. (laughs) Every time Jessica says, I need to talk to you, it's about something I've done. It's not that we need to talk. It's that I need to sit there and I need to listen to what the, what the issue is that, that is on the table, right? When? When's it happening? And so in Romans chapter 11 and verse 25 and verse 26, we have an answer for the when, right? We have an answer for the when. The apostle Paul gives the answer in saying, when the fullness of time has come in regards to the Gentiles. Now, we can know when while still not knowing when, if that's confusing enough, right? Because we don't know who the last Gentile is. But when the last Gentile in God's sovereign plan, according to the rapture, is to happen, when that last Gentile asks the Lord to come into their life, they repent of their sin and they get saved, it is that last Gentile, the fullness of time comes and that is triggering the rapture. That happens, God looks to his son Jesus and Jesus alerts the angel, the archangel, to sound the trumpet, the rapture takes place. If I could make an an observation in how quickly the rapture happens, it is it is kind of like um, when we talk about salvation and the doctrine of regeneration, okay? That means that, that when you believe on Christ, your heart is changed, okay? God changes your heart. Now, it happens so quickly that you don't even really know what's happening. You can't say, well, I know exactly when. It just, no, it just happened, you know? You You got convicted of your sin by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You believed on Christ, and as you believed on Christ, boom, your heart was regenerate. Doesn't mean you were a perfect person. Doesn't mean that you never sinned again. But it means that like David, you now had a heart for God. Right? David was was considered the best friend of God. He still sinned. He still committed some gross sin. But his heart ached and his heart longed for God. The moment we get saved, our heart turns to God. The moment Jesus says, it's here, it happens, boom, it's done. That quick, the rapture comes. And that quick, the rapture takes into effect. Romans 11, 25 and 26 give us that that timetable. And let us know about when when that's going to happen, when the fullness of time comes. Could be tomorrow. Could be before this sermon's over or this lesson's over. Could be a hundred years from now. Not saying it's any of those times. I'm saying we simply don't know. It's when the last Gentile would be saved. Now let's just stop, pause for a second. Anybody have questions? Anybody kind of confused about that or want some, just maybe a little more clarity on that or discuss that at all? Yeah, Oscar? Mm -hmm. Yes, see, 
what we have in what we might call the eschatological timeline, that is last things and how God orchestrates all of that, you're going to have the rapture of the church, the church will be taken out of the world, the tribulation is going to sound off, and during that tribulational period, even though it's going to be harder than it's ever been before, it is going to produce Christians during that time. And so people will be saved during that time. Uh, later on in the tribulation, the Jews will be saved during that time from the, from the witnesses in Revelation 11, I believe it is. Um, and so what you're then going to have is when Jesus returns to set up his millennial kingdom, that thousand-year reign, he is going to return with the raptured saints and the saints that had already died. They're going to come with him, and they're going to meet the tribulational saints, and the tribulational saints and those raptured and those that had died before, they're all going to encompass the millennial kingdom where Jesus will reign for a thousand years while Satan is bound for a thousand years. Great question. Any other questions? This is... This is good stuff. We'll, we'll move on then. Um, now, I mentioned kind of maybe a, a big word, big term, uh, but a term I think we need to know, uh, eschatological, ecclesia, um, uh, eschaton, last things. It's that timeline that God uh, has put together. Okay, And this is where it gets mixed up a little bit because oftentimes people will, will mix up um, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, all of those three things, with um, pre-millennial, post-millennial, all-millennial, okay? And those, are, those are two separate things, all right? So what we're talking about tonight is the rapture in terms of the tribulation, which is very important because there are three different views. There is a pre-trib view. Now, I don't want to make this a Southern Baptist thing. I'm just simply giving you information. Most um, conservative, uh, traditional Southern Baptist people line up with the pre-tribulational um, reign, okay? That they believe um, that before the tribulation happens, before the tribulation occurs, Jesus is going to rapture the church, in other words, the church will not go through even a moment, even a second of the tribulation. But there are other people, believers, they're not lost people, they're not heathens, okay? Um, they believe the Bible. Uh, they believe they'll go uh, at least halfway through the tribulation. They'll go middle of the tribulation, and then halfway through the tribulation, then there will be a rapture that will occur. Then there's a third group that is known as the post. So they'll go all the way through the tribulation. They'll face every ugly thing that happens. They'll see it all. They'll go through that horrendous time. And at the end of that, their reward is to be raptured. Now, I see some serious um, scriptural, biblical, theological problems with believing that you'll go through half of it or you'll go through all of it. Um, I see the scripture as plainly and clearly teaching that we won't face the tribulation, even a minute of the tribulation. And I just kind of want to take you through a little bit of that tonight and take any questions that... Um, that you may have. I first want to kind of set the stage for you, okay? So the entire New Testament, from the Gospels to the book of Acts to the letters, they are all shaping, forming, and instituting the church. Jesus makes it clear that the church is the only institution that God ever promised to bless. It's his invention. It's not, it's not man's invention. You know, it's not just some cutting edge, you know, thing. It's, it's God's institution. It's God's plan, the church. In Acts 2, it's instituted. 
in Matthew, um, in Matthew 16, we find God's promise to build his church. Jesus says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. In Matthew 18, we see church discipline, don't we? We see the ramifications, we see the structure, we see that church discipline is a biblical thing. And so my point is that all through the New Testament, we have instructions, we have the mission, the Great Commission in Matthew 28, we have all of this information about the church. But here's the interesting thing. If you turn to Revelation, (laughs) you turn to Revelation chapter one, what do you find? You find the church. If you turn to Revelation chapter two, what do you find? Church. If you turn to Revelation chapter three, what do you find? The church. And so you have instruction about seven local churches. Two of those local churches were actually on mission for God, doing well, and had uh, nothing bad to say from Jesus about them. The rest of them, five of them, had stuff they needed to repent over. And the other two were in step with God's will. But, now, now think about this. 19 times from Revelation 1 to Revelation 3, the church is mentioned, it's talked about. Now get this, in Revelation chapter four, we looked at this Sunday, it's a throne room of heaven. John is called up to heaven. Revelation chapter five, which we will look at this coming Sunday morning. John uh, is in heaven and there is, um, and there is still much to talk about with Revelation chapter five. But after Revelation chapter three, The church is never mentioned again until Revelation chapter 19. So 19 times it's mentioned from chapter 1 to chapter 3, and then after chapter 3, it's not mentioned again until chapter 19. There's uh, There's no discussion of function. There's no discussion of discipline. There's no discussion of the Great Commission. There's no discussion of worship. There's no discussion of of praying as the church. There's no discussion of church growth. There's no discussion at all about the church. My question to you tonight is, what is Revelation 19? What is that? What's going on in that passage? It's the return of Christ. Who returns with Christ? The church. So it only makes sense that in Revelation, after Revelation 3, the church has been taken out and called to heaven. In, in Revelation 6 to Revelation 18, you have the tribulation. Not a mention of the church there. But in Revelation 19, when we see the return, boom, there's the church again. It's astounding the way that, the way that this is brought out and the way that we can see what God is trying to tell us with the church with the rapture and with how this is all gonna gonna take place and how this is all gonna be fleshed out. Um, let me tell you something that's that's also interesting. While we while we think about all that's going on right now, I mean, we discuss the mark of the beast. You know. Right now, they're trying to get chips approved to put into people that you can go and you can get that scanned and your whole medical history will pop up when you, when you have that chip inserted and people are debating, is this the mark of the beast? Do we want to do this? Is this how it's going to be set up? And it's going to, it's, it's going to be there during the tribulation. There's talk about a no-cash society. Uh, folks, we're already entering into that. I mean, I very rarely, if ever, have cash on me anymore. Paycheck is direct deposit, use my check card. I mean, I don't, I don't touch cash. We're already moving in that direction of, of, of many people not having cash on them. Everything's paid online a lot of, in a lot of cases. And so we can already see it being set up that way. Here's a question for you, though. Here's a question. If what I just showed you is not true, if the church is not raptured first, 
Why is it that through the book of Revelation, we don't see any warnings for the church? There's nobody warning the church the tribulation's coming. There's nobody, there's no prophet, there's no apostle, there's nobody saying, listen, the, listen, the trib is coming. This great tribulation's about to unfold. You, you better get saved so you can at least only have to go through half of it. We don't see any warnings. Raise your hand tonight if you enjoy traveling. You just enjoy traveling places. Anybody? Gosh, I'm the only one? Really? Okay. So, you know, so let's say you're going to Orlando, Florida, just, just as an example. Um, you'll see signs that'll say maybe uh, 100 miles. See another sign that'll say 75 miles, 50 miles, 25 miles, 10 miles, 5 miles, 1 mile. But what happens when you get into Orlando? There's no more signs, are there? Because you're in Orlando. There's no more signs saying one more mile to Orlando. The church has already been raptured. Why would anybody warn about the tribulation and about the rapture? It's already happened, right? The only thing you're going to see from that point on is the gospel preached for people in the tribulation to be saved and then to be a part of the indwelling of the earth, the millennial kingdom that is to come. Nobody warning. Right now, turn on your TV and You'll see, you'll see people like Jim Baker that's on the TV, and he's still trying to sell you um, supplies for the Armageddon. Uh, you'll see all kinds of warnings and signs and, and, and people. I have, a, I have a pastor friend that I'm in the, in the PhD program with, and, and he was sharing that he had a guy show up at his church on a Sunday morning and said, I am Jesus, and I have a, I have a message for your church. And he said, unless you repent, you're not coming through that door. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're seeing people that obviously, some delusional, but people that are warning of a time that is to come. We don't see a warning here because it's already happened, right? Here's, here's another observation that we, that we run into when we think about the the rapture of the church. Let's imagine tonight that we're holding to a view of, let's say a post-tribulational view, okay? So you're gonna go through the entire tribulation and at the end of the tribulation, you're going to be raptured. Can I just ask, what's the point? <laughs> what is the point? So you're going up and then you're coming back down? So, so he's going to rapture you at the end only to bring you back for the millennial kingdom. We're not six years old at the, at the Sears store, the JCPenney store, trying to go up the escalator and back down because it's fun. I mean, this is serious business. We're dealing with God's logical system of preserving and taking care of the church. And let me ask you another question. How do we reconcile in the book of Genesis where Abraham is told that Sodom and Gomorrah is going to be destroyed? And Abraham says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, God. Wait a minute. What if I can find 50 righteous men? And God plays along with Abraham and uh, says, okay, Abraham, you go and find 50 righteous men. Men, and I won't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, God. If you know that narrative well at all, you'll know that Abraham keeps coming back to God. How about 40? How about 30? How about 20? How about five? <laughs> Couldn't even find five righteous men. You know what Abraham's argument was to God? It's really a genius argument. He played off the character of God, and he says this to God. He says, God, it's not like you to destroy the wicked and the righteous together. Hmm. Now, it's not that we've met a place of perfection. It's not that we're perfect before God. But we're innocent before God in the sense that we've been washed in the blood of the Lamb who's been slain. Remember, Sunday's message is worthy is the Lamb. <laughs> We've been saved in the blood of the Lamb. 
far be it from God to treat those slain in the blood of the Lamb as he would in the punishment of those who have rebelled against his plan and are in the time of the tribulation. Now, I'm going to show you something powerful in just a second, but we've covered a lot here, and I haven't really given you a chance through a lot of this in a while, so do you have any questions? Anything you want to say? Warren. Yeah, 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 I'd be glad to. Um, you have the tribulation, which is a setup for the great tribulation. And so if I, could bring, if I could bring Matthew 7 into play, and I could illustrate it with Jesus' warning of, of the false prophets. He tells us that the false prophet is going to come to us as a wolf in sheep's clothing. So he doesn't come in the garment of the prophet. He doesn't come in the garment of the sheep. He comes in the garment of the shepherd. He comes claiming to be the shepherd, right? He's in sheep's clothing. And the imagery, Warren, is that by the time the sheep realize who he really is, it's too late. He snatches them. He tears them to pieces. And the picture is so is so powerful and is so graphic that this wolf is tearing to pieces the hooves of the, of the lambs to get every little bit of morsel of meat from that. It's like watching Pat eat ribs. I mean, it is gruesome. It is really gruesome. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, he's, he's trying to draw a picture there of what the false prophet's going to be. But if he came in announcing, hey, I'm the false prophet and I'm here to kill you, Who's going to stay for that, right? Heresy doesn't say, hey, I'm coming into Eastside Baptist Church um, and uh, I would like to sign up to teach a Sunday school class. <laughs> they, don't, they don't say that. They come in unknowingly, Jude tells us, and through time they begin to teach and that comes out and they begin to, to, to bring their heresy. They don't come announcing it, right? So the Antichrist didn't come in saying, hey, I'm the Antichrist. He does these amazing works. He gets the peace treaty signed with Israel and the enemy. He does all these things that cannot possibly be done. He brings unity where so much division is that they look upon him like one looks upon Christ and they say, there's something about this man. And they don't call him antichrist, not then. They say there's something special about this man. He's bringing all the people together. Do you know how Jim Baker not Jim Baker, do you know how Jim Jones was able to get a thousand people to follow him in Ghana and get them to drink the poison? He was able to bring racial reconciliation at a time where races weren't coming together. He was able to uh, bring homes and systems into the mentally challenged at a time where that wasn't being done. He was doing groundbreaking things that spoke to the people and the people looked upon him as a prophet. So everything Jim Jones said, they bought into it hook, line, and sinker. There's a book called Deceived where the writer of Deceived was trying to prove that had these people had a church background, they would have never fallen for Jim Jones. He was sad that through his research found out everybody in Jonestown had a church background, some of them had Bible degrees and all kinds, of, all kinds of stuff, and even the subtlety of the false prophet deceived them and they wound up in Ghana drinking poison and dying because they believed he was Jesus. You see, you have that, tr that tribulation that everything's going great, first three and a half years, it's all great. Then all of a sudden, the Antichrist goes into the temple, he desecrates the temple, and that is the signal. That is when the lever has been turned for what we call the great tribulation, where it's three and a half years now of the worst time you're ever going to see or read about or even imagine. So for the first three and a half years, it's not really bad. It's, it's really only bad for the last three and a half years. And you're saying we're not going to see any of that. Not see any of that. Not going to see a minute of that. No. No, because the church is taken before that. We're not going to see the Antichrist. 
We're not going to see the tribulation. We're not going to see um, any of that kind of stuff. We'll see false prophets because we're told that, that many are going to come in Jesus' name. Many are going to claim to be prophets. Many are going to claim to be Christ, which has already even happened, and, and they're simply not. Great question. Any other questions? There, there will be, yes, there, there, there will be a, well, there'll be a war in heaven to, um, to begin with there. And there'll be what, we, what they call Armageddon. So that's true. There is, there is the war. Yeah, that's a great comment. Um, anybody else? Question? Wow, I have settled it all for you. I am, I am, I'm really glad, really glad about that. Let me show you the powerful verse, and we're going to kind of close on this, on this end if I haven't already convinced you in a, in a pre-tribulational rapture, I want to show you through verse 10 in Revelation chapter 3 how God himself has, has said it. Remember, you have the church in Revelation 1, Revelation 2, and Revelation 3. He addresses the church. Two of the churches um, didn't need to repent. They were walking with the Lord. And so in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10, I want you to look at this. This is really powerful. Because you have kept my command to endure, I will also keep you from the hour of testing that is going to come on the whole world. Now you need to really note that. A time of testing that's going to come on the whole world to test those who live on the earth. This is not just a hard time. This is not a simple test. This is not just some irrelevant kind of test that's going to hit the land. He's talking about the tribulation. He's talking about the testing being of the great tribulation that's going to come on the earth. He's talking about the church being the faithful. And he's saying, I'm going to keep you from it. I'm going to pull you out of it. I'm not going to let you be a part of the testing that is coming to the world that the whole world will have to endure. I mean, get what he's saying here. This testing, it's not just the Middle East. It wasn't just this area the church is located in in, in um, Philadelphia. He's not talking about one little area. He's saying the whole world, the whole world will endure this testing. But you, the church, the true church, I'm going to remove you and you won't have to endure the testing, the tribulation that is coming. There are even some versions that don't say testing, they say tribulation. And so I believe this is quite possibly one of the strongest pre-tribulational rapture passages we have in Holy Scripture where Jesus himself is telling us that the church is not going to go through the tribulation, but instead they're going to be removed. They're going to be raptured. They're going to be sucked out of the earth. And they're going to be with Jesus as all the other events will unfold from heaven. Now, um, as we look at that, are there any, any final questions that you might have tonight? As we've looked at this being a singular event, we've looked at because it's an event, it has to happen. We know it happens when the fullness of time comes with the Gentiles, and uh, we know it's not associated with judgment. There's not a judgment here. It is, it is those who know Christ that are going to be rescued and taken. So anybody, final question. Be glad to, glad to take it tonight. Okay, all right. Let me just maybe just ask, and if you want to give a comment, you can. If you want to nod your head, that's fine too. Um, does the format of, of doing more teaching, what we might call teaching rather than just preaching, giving you an opportunity to raise your hand and ask questions and respond to the, 
to what we're looking at. Do you find that helpful? Do you find that something you enjoy? Okay, okay, okay. All right, because that, that's really what I'm trying to do here. That's really my point. It's 